Hey there, all you cool cats and kittens. Welcome back to Bio 150 Lecture, and we're going to pick up right where we left off, talking about the traits that eukaryotes have that contribute to their success. And where we are in this list of unique traits of the eukaryotes, the Steve Jobs of the cellular world, the innovators. We're going to pick up where we left off talking about multicellularity. So we've already talked about multicellularity and what it is. If you haven't seen that lecture, please go and check that out before you get into this one. So when we talked about multicellularity, we left off talking about the fact that it's evolved at least six times independently in different eukaryotic groups, in the animals, the fungi, red algae, green algae, and brown algae. But it hasn't evolved in so many other eukaryotic groups. And so why hasn't complex multicellularity evolved in other lineages? So let's talk about some of the impediments or obstacles that organism groups have to overcome for multicellularity to evolve, or the issues with complex multicellularity and what's needed for multi complex multicellularity to evolve. So number one, for complex multicellularity to evolve, for it to work, you, know, you need organisms to figure out ways to coordinate all of the cells so that they work together. So you can think of this little diagram right here, teamwork, where all the puzzle pieces are fitting together to make a coherent word. Each of those little puzzle pieces you can think of as a cell or a system or an organ system or a tissue that has to work together. The cells have to work together to get an organism to work. And so you need to coordinate all those different cells to get a multicellular organism. And on top of that, you need to have different types of cells that play different roles. So you need a way to get, diff need a way to get different types of cells. And that's a little bit counterintuitive if you think about every cell in an organism it all has or all the cells in your body have the same genome they have the same genetic material they have the same number of chromosomes so how is it if they all have the exact same genetic material that you get completely different cell types completely different traits and so how do you get this cell specialization where despite the fact that they have all the same genetic material they have very we have very very different cell types that play very very different roles and lastly, how do you feed all of the cells in a multicellular organism? So you need a way to deliver food to every single one of those cells and also get rid of all the waste that each of those cells produces. And you need to do that for organisms where every single cell is not directly exposed to the environment. So if you think of all of the cells that exist, the millions and millions of cells that exist inside your body that aren't directly exposed to the environment, how do you deliver nutrients to those cells? And how do you get the waste out of those cells that they can go back out into the environment when diffusion alone is not enough? So what adaptations are needed to accomplish all of these goals or overcome these obstacles? And so when we talk about these first two obstacles of adhesion and communication between cells, we have cell coordination. So I'm going to talk about the particular adaptations that multicellular organisms have evolved for this cell coordination to address these issues of adhesion and communication between cells. In terms of um, genetic programming and cell differentiation, gene regulation helps with cell specialization and coordination as well. And so when we have this other um, issue of cell specialization, coordination, genetic programming and cell differentiation are important adaptations that have enabled um, different cell types to evolve and coordinate between each other. And lastly, we have internal transport of nutrients and waste to and from each cell. And that's something that we refer to as bulk flow. And bulk flow addresses this, this issue, this earlier issue that we talked about of nutrient and wastes. And so adhesion, communication, um, those are all adaptations that help address cell coordination. Genetic programming and cell differentiation, aka gene regulation, help regulate cell specialization, or I'm sorry, help address this issue of cell specialization and coordination. And particular traits that aid in the internal transport of nutrients and waste to and from each cell help with this issue of getting nutrients into and waste out of each individual cell. And so I'm going to talk about what each of these things are in a little bit more detail, just working through each of these major types of adaptations that allowed for the evolution of complex multi multicellularity, starting with the adhesion between cells. So adhesion just means that cells must adhere to one another. And this is something that's seen in both simple and complex multicellularity. If you've got or cells that are sort of binding to, an, to one another, whether it's a simpy, simple multicellular organism or a complex multicellular organism, um, basically you need proteins 
that link these cells together. Basically, these are acting like little pieces of Velcro that stick each cell together. And if you look at multicellular organisms, all of them have evolved specialized proteins that allow them to link up. And these are just a couple examples of those proteins. So here you're looking at the plasma membrane and the sort of cytosol or the fluid. So this is the edge of one cell and this is the edge of another cell. And this is the intercellular space or the space between those cells. And on the outside sort of linked up in this intercellular space, you have these different proteins that are sort of latched in or anchored into each cell. And then they have these linking up parts where they link to each, each cell to each other. So you can have these things called cadherins, selectins, integrins. All of these things are different proteins that have evolved to basically link different cells together. And I wouldn't expect you to remember the names or memorize the names of any of these proteins. I just want you to understand that these proteins had to evolve. So individual cells had to evolve these particular proteins that are embedded in their plasma membranes to get those cells to link together. They basically had to evolve this sort of Velcro that sticks them all together. And that's an important trait that had to evolve in the first place before you can even get to complex multicellularity. The next part that you need is some sort of communication between the cells. So remember, it, this is something that's important for complex multicellular organisms because these connect connections allow signals to be passed between cells. So if you have cells that are performing different functions or even cells that are performing similar functions that are part of a larger tissue, you need those cells to be able to communicate with one another to coordinate different sort of complex activities. So whether that's a bunch of muscle tissues simultaneously being able to expand or contract or that earlier example we looked at with different cell types uh, surrounding your stomach where one cell has to release acids to sort of break down food and another cell type has to reduce um, other um, sort of neutralizing bases to neutralize the stomach acid. You've got to have coordination and communication between all those cells. And so you've got to have sort um, things, traits adapted in those cells or evolved in those cells to allow coordination and communication between the cells. And in animals, what we see is they use something called gap junctions. And what you're looking at here, so these are two animal cells and a bunch of animal cells that make up a complex multicellular organism. And if you zoom in on this area right here, you can see these little purple sort of star-shaped things right here that are made up of a bunch of proteins that are linked together in these sort of circular areas. And so you have a plasma membrane of one cell here, a plasma membrane of another cell here, and the space between the cells here. And you can see that these things called gap junctions are moving across or connecting across the intercellular space. So these little rings of proteins that are embedded in the plasma membrane allow other proteins or signaling proteins to move across from one cell to another to allow the cells to send communicating signals to one another. So it's basically just a little tube for these two cells to talk to one another. Now, in plant cells, we have a slightly different uh, type of communication system between cells, and they use something called plasmodesmata. So all the plasmodesmata are, are actual interconnections between cells. And so if you think about a plant cell in a complex multicellular plant, you've got one cell here, another cell here, another cell here, and those cells have membranes, plasma membranes, and then around the plasma membranes are stiff, stiffer cell walls. And so in those cell walls, if you zoom in on this area and take a look, you can see that this cell wall, the cell walls have basically holes that are drilled through them. And drilled isn't the right word for it because those just sort of naturally exist in the cell walls. And this blue area represents the plasma membrane. And the plasma membrane is actually connected across this entire tube. So it's almost like the plasma membrane is connected across all of these cells. And you can have signaling molecules and different nutrients and cells move across from one cell to another through these gaps. And in addition, sometimes you can have entire organelles that move across. In this case, you can see the endoplasmic reticulum actually moves across or through these plasmodesmata junctions. And so just to reiterate, the whole point here is we've got these connections between the cells so that they can communicate with one another. Animal cells use something called gap junction, so they've evolved a slightly different um, adaptation to accomplish this task, whereas in plant cells, where multicellularity has evolved independently, we have a slightly different adaptation that's accomplishing the same goal, and in this case in plants, it's something called plasmodesmata. But in both cases, it's just allowing the cells to communicate with one another. So it enables interior cells to get information about the outside world,
So if there's cells or other organ parts of the organism that are in contact with the outside world, those um, signals can get communicated between cells. It also enables cells to coordinate with one another in tissues, organs, and organ systems. So what is needed for complex multicellularity? So we talked about um, the third aspect, which is genetic programming for cell differentiation and organization. So in order to have a complex multicellular organism, you need to have specialized cells that have different sort of roles. So you can think about the neurons that make up uh, our nervous system. You can think about the muscles and muscle cells that combine to make muscle tissues that make up our muscular system. You can think about the bone cells that make up our skeletal system. In all of these cases, those cells had to come from somewhere, right? Because we all started out as a single cell zygote where an egg and a sperm came together and that created our initial genetic information. And that had all the genetic information necessary to make all of these different cell types. So how do you start with one initial zygote and one cell type and get it to make all of these complex types of cells all of those cells to combine into different tissues, all of those tissues to bind into organ systems. How do those cells know what to turn into? How do they know where to go? And all of that involves complex gene regulation and cell signaling. So when you have gene regulation, which we talked about in a previous lecture, that can tell which genes to turn on, how much to turn on, when to turn on, which proteins to express, how much of those proteins to express, such that all of that information is contained in our chromosomes. And those chromosomes can turn on particular genes at the right times in the right places to make these initial cells as we're developing know what cells to turn into, how many of those cells to make, and where to go. And that also enables those cells furthermore through gene regulation organization to organize into tissues, those tissues to organize into organs, and those organs to organize into organ systems. And so all of that information is contained in our chromosomes, in our genome. And it's that gene regulation that's able to tell which chromosomes and which genes to turn on and off to have this sort of cell specialization. The last part that we wanted to talk about or I want to talk about is the internal transport of nutrients and waste to and from each cell or something called bulk flow. So if you think about complex multicellular organisms, so we can look at a, a woolly mammoth or an elephant just to give you an example of a really giant animal. Obviously every part of that animal is not in direct contact with the environment. And so every cell in that makes up the, you know, the millions and trillions of cells that make up that complex organism, they all need access to nutrients. They all need to get rid of wastes that are developed in those cells. And so how do they get those wastes out of the body to the environment? And how do they get new nutrients that are collected from the environment, from the food that that animal eats, back to every single cell? So large organisms, multicellular organisms, they have a low surface area relative to their total volume. And many cells are not exposed to the environment. So how do they get the nutrients in and the waste out of every single cell? And the way you do that is through something called bulk flow. So when I talk about bulk flow, what I'm talking about is any means by which molecules move through organisms at a rate beyond those possible by diffusion across a gradient, okay? So diffusion, remember, is just a simple sort of random movement of any sort of molecule within a medium. And so the bulk flow is moving, um, using energy to move any sort of nutrient or waste or any molecule really faster than simple diffusion alone. And when we talk about bulk flow in multicellular organisms, we're talking about movement uh, through animals and movement through plants and the sort of complex systems that they've evolved to push these um, molecules through them at a fast rate faster than diffusion. And so if we look at bulk flow in animals, the circulatory system is a really wonderful example of the complex traits that multicellular organisms have evolved for bulk flow and to transport oxygen and nutrients to tissues and carbon dioxide and waste out of tissues. And so I think it's really important for you to understand that the circulatory system, we often think about it moving oxygen and carbon dioxide around, but it plays a much uh, more central role and it moves things other than just oxygen and carbon dioxide. It also has to get other nutrients to cells. So you can think about your blood sugar levels. It's really important to maintain a proper blood sugar level. And there's other sort of salts and nutrients that have to be maintained through the circulatory system. And there's lots of other wastes that have to get moved out of your body through the circulatory system other than just carbon dioxide. And so this is the central way 
that nutrients and waste get moved around to every single cell in your body. And if you were to, so this is a very for, sort of simplified example, but when we look at what's actually going on in, for example, a human body in terms of the circulatory system, um, so this right here is an example of a plastified uh, human head where all the tissue except for the vascular tissue has been removed. And what you can see is there's vascular tissue, whether you're talking about veins, arteries, or capillaries that are innervating almost every single part of the human face and head. And the whole reason for that is you've got to get blood essentially to every single cell in your body. And so what these capillaries are doing is act, essentially acting to increase the relative surface area to volume ratios of your body. It's creating a ton of surface area so that those individual um, veins and arteries innervate every single part of your body and get in contact or very close contact to almost all of your cells so that they can deliver nutrients and get waste out of all of those cells. And in fact, it increases or creates so much surface area total that if you're to lay out all of the arteries, capillaries, and veins in one adult end-to-end, -end, they'd stretch almost 60,000 miles. So once again, the whole point here is to have a lot of surface area for exchange of nutrients and wastes and get those nutrient wastes, um, the nutrients into your body and the wastes out, to, out of all of the cells in your body. Now, if you look at the plant vascular system or bulk flow in plants, they've evolved a very, a relatively similar system. Um, instead of having vascular, or I'm sorry, like uh, veins and arteries, they have different types of vascular tissues. So you may remember learning about the xylem and phloem. But this, essentially what this is, is a very similar set of tubes that deliver water and nutrients from the soils up to the leaves where they need it. And then we have another set of tubes um, that essentially transport all of the sugars that are made by photosynthesis in the leaves out to the rest of the plant in places that it needs it. And once again, this is all about bulk flow and essentially increasing the surface area of the plant artificially by adding all of these tubes that innervate and touch on every single cell or most of the cells within a plant um, so that nutrients can get to all of the plant, plant cells and parts that need them. So once again, we're sort of increasing the overall surface area to volume ratio of the plant and delivering nutrients to and removing waste from each cell using this bulk flow system or the plant vascular system. Okay, so to recap, for complex multicellularity and the adaptations that are needed, number one, you need adhesion between cells. Number two, you need communication between cells. Number three, you need genetic programming um, and to have cell differentiation, and we use the, do this through gene regulation. And lastly, you need internal transport of nutrients and waste to and from each cell. And this is done through bulk flow. And so these first two adaptations aid in cell coordination, this issue of coordinating all the cells. Um, gene regulation aids in the cell specialization so we can get all of these different cell types. It also aids in coordination of cells by telling cells sort of essentially where they need to go during development. It helps coordinate those aspects for the formation of tissues and organs. And lastly, um, this idea or the internal transport systems or vascular systems that have evolved aid in bulk flow of nutrients and wastes to every single cell in these organisms. So quick question, which of the following is not a benefit of multicellularity? And for some of this information, you may have to refer back to our previous lecture. So if you said C, multicellular organisms are typically more complex than unicellular organisms, that is a true statement, but that is not necessarily a benefit of multicellularity. So complexity in itself is not a benefit. So there can be benefits associated with complexity if you have more specialization or if you're larger so you can get larger prey. Those are actual benefits. But all things being equal, being com more complex versus unicellular, one is not advantageous over the other. And that's why this is not a benefit of multicellularity, whereas these other two things are. Which is the best definition of a genome? Okay, so which is the best definition of a genome? If you said A, you are correct. So all of the genetic material an organism has. So it's important to make the distinction between all of the genetic material 
versus just the genes. So hopefully you can remember back from previous lessons in Bio 140 or another course that you took earlier where anywhere in your genetic material you can have coding regions that are considered genes that code for a protein, but you can also have non-coding regions. And it turns out that those non-coding regions can also play important roles and um, also make up an organism's total genome or all of the genetic material that an organism has. So remember the genetic or your genome is made up not just of the genes you have, but all of the genetic material. All of the genes in the nucleus of an organism, so this is wrong because it's not just the genes, it's all the genetic material, not just the coding regions. And also, um, many eukaryotic organisms have genetic material outside of the nucleus, and you can have prokaryotic organisms that don't even have a nucleus, and they still have what's called a genome, right? And all the genes in the plasmid of an organism, so once again, you can have DNA that's outside of a plasmid, and you can have non-coding regions, and so this would not be considered a genome either. In general, how can two cells of a complex multicellular organism have the same genome, but markedly different structures and functions? Okay, if you said B, you are correct. So different genes are expressed in different cells. So what this means is you can have one cell, um, for example, a neuron that has the entire genome. It has all the same genes as, say, another cell type. We'll call it a muscle cell type. But in that neuron, different genes are expressed in different ways, whereas in the muscle cell, it has other genes that are expressed in different ways. And so what that means is you can have two different cells with the exact same genome, but they play very different roles and look very different. And so it's important to understand that you can have the same genome in different cell types, and that's because, or you can still get those different cell types and have those different cells with different functions because the genomes are expressed in different ways. Which of the following is not one of the adaptations necessary for multicellularity? Okay, cell conflagration is the answer. That is just a nonsense thing. That's not even something that we talked about. I don't even think that it's a real thing. So cell adhesion, remember, is very important where you need to have cells linking together to have multicellularity. You need to have communication between the cells in order for them to coordinate with one another in a multicellular organism. You need to have cell differentiation and organization. So you can't have a multicellular organism with different specialized cells if you don't have those cells differentiating into different cell types. And you need bulk flow to deliver nutrients to all the different cells that make up a multicellular organism because many of them are not in direct contact with the environment and diffusion alone is not going to be enough. So when we talk about the evolution of complex multicellularity and when it appeared, in the sort of deep uh, geological history of Earth. We can refer back to this figure here looking at the origin of Earth about four and a half billion years ago, the first prokaryotes coming onto the scene about 3.75 billion years ago. We see the first single-celled eukaryotes coming around somewhere around two billion years ago. We see simple multicellularity evolving somewhere around 1.5 billion years ago. And then we have complex multicellularity coming onto the scene about 550 million years ago. And so it took a very long time for complex multicellularity to come onto the scene. And if we were to go back to this sort of 30-day calendar where we condense this entire 4.5 billion years of history on Earth into a 30-day calendar, it'd be around day 24 that we see simple multicellularity coming onto the scene, and it wouldn't be until about day 27 that complex multicellularity evolves, so very late in the game. And so the question becomes, why did it take so long for multicellularity to evolve? And part of the answer to that is that the required characteristics that we think uh, were needed for multicellular to evolve had to evolve sequentially. You need each of these different aspects of multicellularity to come onto the scene, and it's hard for all those things to just evolve at one single time. So let's look at that pattern in animals. So here we're looking at the phylogenetic tree of different animal groups and the outgroup of animals, which is coanoflagellates. And so 
Here, this represents animals, so everything up here are all different groups of animals. So we've got sponges, we've got jellyfish, we've got insects, mammals, and other animals with bilateral symmetry, so the groups that we typically think of being animals. But jellyfish and sponges are actually all technically animals as well. And these numbers that you see in parentheses afterwards are just the number of different species that are described for each of these groups. So you can see that insects, mammals, and other bilateral uh, animal groups are very, very diverse in terms of the numbers of species that exist, with as many as 10 million species uh, estimated to be out there. And so if we look at these groups, and we look at the evolution of the different complex traits required for multicellularity, we can see that adhesion and cell signaling is a trait that all of these groups have, even the outgroup coanoflagellates that are not technically animals but very closely related. We had this trait of adhesion evolving, and all of these organisms have cells that are able to adhere. And then we have the evolution of gap junctions. And so we only see that in jellyfish and then these other bilateral ant groups of animals. So things like insects, mammals, and other animal animals, their cells all have these gap junctions, whereas sponges, even though they're considered to be animals, do not have gap junctions. And then lastly, we have bulk flow evolving, where you can deliver all these different nutrients and get rid of waste throughout the organism. So we have complex sort of vascular systems and circulatory systems that evolve. Um, and once you've got this bulk flow, then you've got this very complex multicellularity. So you've got adhesion, you've got communication, you've got bulk flow, and you've got all the things that you needed for complex multicellularity. And then you see, once that uh, bulk flow comes around, a so-called explosion of species. So way more species diversity here. And so Basically, what I'm trying to say is that once you've got all of these traits necessary for multicellularity, um, you set the stage for lots of different species to evolve because you've got all of those important aspects and traits of multicellularity there. So in other words, for multicellularity to evolve, complex multicellularity, first you need adhesion to evolve. You can't have bulk flow without adhesion and without intercell communication. Once you've got adhesion, then you can evolve intercell communication. Once you've got both of these things, you can have bulk flow. And so these things had to evolve in sequential order. And it's very sort of difficult, evolutionarily speaking, for each of these things to occur. Let's look at the other required characteristics, um, or let's look at this pattern in plants. So here we're looking at the land plants that are all these groups here, vascular plants. This is the number of species that we know about. This is mosses, this is green algae, and we can look at the evolution of these different traits. So we have adhesion or cell signaling evolving in all of these groups. Then we have communication evolving next. So mosses, some green algae, and vascular plants. And then we have bulk transport evolving twice in the vascular plants and some moss relatives. And so once again, you've got bulk flow enabling the diversification of many different species. And you have this sort of sequential order where before you can have bulk flow, you've got to get intercell communication. And before you can have intercell communication, you've got to have adhesion. And so each of these things has to come before the next, before you can get to this sort of last step of the necessary traits for complex multicellularity. Um, and one last thing that I want to talk about related to the evolution of complex multicellularity is the need for atmospheric oxygen. So there's another hypothesis for why it took so long for bulk flow to evolve and for complex multicellularity to evolve. And that's the need for high levels of oxygen to support a large bodied organism. So let's talk about this hypothesis for a little bit. So here we're just looking at a graph that looks at the time millions of years before the present going all the way back to about 4 billion years ago. And we're looking at the atmospheric oxygen as a percentage of the current levels of oxygen that we have. So it's not until around 500, 550 million years ago that we start to see oxygen levels approaching the 100% or the normal levels of oxygen that we see in the atmosphere today. And that's because we needed certain organisms, um, photosynthetic organisms, to appear in the fossil record um, in the old evolutionary past of Earth that produce lots of oxygen and pump the atmosphere full of it. And so it wasn't, once again, until about 550 million years ago that we start to see oxygen at the current levels we see in the atmosphere today. And if you line this up with different major evolutionary events in the history of life on Earth, you can see life appearing on the scene here. You can see eukaryotes popping onto the scene about two and a half billion years ago, simple multicellularity. 
around 2 billion years ago, and then complex multicellularity not coming onto the scene until about 550 million years ago. And interestingly, this aligns with when we see a big uptake in the amount of oxygen that's available in the atmosphere. And so the hypothesis is this may be linked. There may be it may be because we're seeing higher levels of oxygen that it made way for complex multicellularity to evolve. And the idea is that complex multicellularity only spread through Earth um, or over Earth as the oxygen content in the atmosphere and oceans increased. And so the, the question is, did it require oxygen? And if so, why would it require oxygen? And the main idea here, one of the sort of hypotheses is that big organisms need tons of energy to survive. So in order to enable to be able to sustain a giant organism, whether it be a giant redwood tree or a cheetah, you need to have a ton of energy available for those organisms to be able to survive. And the way you get a ton of energy or a ton of ATP, which is the sort of cellular currency for energy, is you needed the evolution of uh, aerobic cellular respiration. So when we talk about aerobic cellular respiration, this is the cellular respiration that mitochondria do. And remember this aerobic cellular respiration, by definition, aerobic means oxygen is required. And so you needed to have lots and lots of oxygen around to be able to do aerobic cellular respiration at a high rate. And as it turns out, aerobic cellular respiration produces tons and tons of energy or ATP in comparison to other metabolic reactions that we know about. And so if we can do aerobic cellular respiration and we can have a lot of oxygen available in the environment, we can produce a lot of the ATP that's required for these complex multicellular organisms to get the energy that they need to survive. And so the hypothesis is that once we have higher concentrations of O2 in the environment, we can have much greater ATP production through this greater amounts of aerobic cellular respiration, and that provides sufficient energy to support complex multicellularity. And this is supposed to provide, or this is one hypothesis for why we don't see complex multicellularity coming onto the scene until much later. So just to reiterate, complex multicellularity took a long time to evolve, in part because we needed the sequential evolution of adhesion, then cell communication, and then bulk flow. And simultaneously, we also, at least the current running hypothesis is, there needed to be enough oxygen in the atmosphere, a sort of threshold level of oxygen in the atmosphere, in order to be able to produce the amount of energy for organisms to be able to produce the amount of energy they need to support complex multicellularity.